Hello, South Strong Nation, Joe Simons, like diamonds. Who else? Who else is on this podcast? This Ooh. video podcast. Luke Simons over here, like diamonds. Tony Acevedo over here, like avocado. Somewhat. <laughs> Guys, we just got finished with an inner circle call. Some of you might be saying, "What the heck's inner circle?" Well, this is our second time doing it. It's a, a year-long program. It can go longer if you like it to, and it's where we get on a weekly call with our inner circle members and get on maps and literally show you where to go fishing based on everything that's going on with the temperature and the wind and all that great stuff. It is, I, you know, it's always interesting, the, the game of golf, right? Similar to, to fishing, uh, meaning, you know, most of us are playing golf not to win money because but because it brings us enjoyment and we get to be outside, et cetera. Same with fishing, right? Most of us aren't trying to go pro at it. And with golf, if you want to get better, there's an easy way to do it that most people do. And it's not like an embarrassing thing to do is you, you hire coaching, right? You go to a pro, you, you find someone who is a golf coach. There's thousands of thousands of golf coaches and yet fishing, you know, didn't have that. And I think we're kind of filling in that gap between hiring a guide every day, which would cost you 700 bucks a day, which is, I don't know, 40, $50,000 a year. Um, and, and just trying to learn everything the hard way. And that's what our inner circle does. It's invitation only. You have to be an insider to even get invited. So if you are an insider, uh, shoot Carol an email. The best way to get her is just that fish at saltstrong.com fish at saltstrong.com. She can get you invitation to the inner circle. And if you're not an insider member, what the heck are you waiting on? I think by the end of this call slash podcast slash video, you will be a member. And, and the reason why is we're going to talk about the number one reason that most all fishermen fail, including the three of us on this call, including pretty much every angler that we've ever had on this show at some point was failing because of this. And most of us, including me looking back, we never would admit to this because in our mind, like, oh, that's not me, that's someone else. And yet, uh, even today, find myself falling back into the same problem slash pattern. And we're going to talk about the problem here in one second. We're going to talk about what's going to happen if you don't fix it, and then ultimately how to fix it, like show some really cool tools that you can be getting completely risk-free here. Uh, that will help you explode just how many fish you catch and how many tight lines that you're getting. And so here's the problem. Here's the reason that the majority of fishermen are failing. And it's because they keep going back to the same handful of spots. That's it. I mean, it's in, in, in Tony and we all talked uh, offline and Tony said when he first started, he was a bass guy. Like a lot of us, you know, ex bass fishermen start getting into saltwater fishing. They find one spot and like, Oh, cool. I caught a nice redfish there. I'm going to keep going back there. And then maybe one more spot. And all of a sudden it's like three, like we're capped out. Oh my gosh, I got my three spots. I'm good. I'm and guess what? Tony kept fishing in the same three spots for a couple months. And next thing you know, dude's frustrated. It's because fish move they have fins and no fences fish are going to be moving they move every single day and not to mention every single season they're moving drastically but every single day every tide cycle these predator fish that we love to catch are moving and so that's going to be the focus of today's podcast slash youtube is getting more spots spots are your problem and we want to give you more of them right lukey well, it, but specifically, it's it's type of spot mm. trumps a GPS spot. Yes. Right? So it's the key, and, and I still even fall into it, but for years, and I'll show you an exact spot in particular. That was, that was the first time we ever caught a slam. Do I remember Dennis Oss took us out, and uh, he's an ex, ex, ex baseball player. He's an avid fisherman. Took us out to some spots. One in particular, we caught our slam. First slam ever. We were super pumped. Uh, Cause we grew up bass fishing and, and uh, at least my bass fishing spots, I feel like freshwater fish don't move nearly as much as saltwater. I mean, like saltwater, the tides are moving constantly and I, I never would, would make huge changes on my bass spots from like one day to the other, or even like even throughout the day. But with saltwater, right, you have changing tide cycles and the, the winds, a lot of the biggest fish are up in the shallowest water but that shallow water is very prone to getting totally changed on a wind change. 
or, uh, or a cold front, like a, a temperature change, that shallow water is very prone to going from very comfortable to the fish to very uncomfortable to the fish, and they're gonna move accordingly. And so if you're not putting yourself in the right type of spot based on the conditions, you are almost guaranteeing inconsistent results. And again, we know that from experience because it was years and years of, uh, of frustration and it, it finally, I guess, I guess we were a little bit stubborn, but it took us a long time to finally at least acknowledge that. And then it took even more time to start putting the pieces together on what type of spot to go to based on the specific conditions. And, 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 and of part of it, yeah, part of it, Luke, was just having a couple of those days because back then we we're also held hostage to live bait. And, you know, if you're having a tough day of getting live bait and you get out there a little bit late or you sleep in and all of a sudden everyone is already, like, especially on a Saturday, right? Everyone's already in your spots and we're like, okay, like, uh, I will go to the next one. Someone's already there. We'll go to the next one. And like, we were like a lost kid at Disney. We're like, what do we do? And, and some of that almost like forced us to go out there and, and explore a new area. And we realized, well, doggone, this is pretty fun. And talk about rewarding when you do find a brand new spot on your own that's like loaded with fish. And the cool part is it's super predictable. I mean, I'm not going to ever say it's just simple that you can do it every single time and you're going to catch an inshore slam every time you go out there. But I know Luke and Tony, uh, you guys fish a whole lot more than me. So you have a little bit more proof of this, but I mean, you could go a hundred trips in a row and at least just know you're going to get tight lines. All right. And that's really what most of us are, are after is just that knowing confidently especially if we have kids or friends with us that we can put people on fish. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. Yeah. And the, and the worst part was, and, and you touched on a little bit, Joe, is that we, you know, at that time, first of all, I had that one spot from Dennis and we'll show it in a second. And then, then we kind of picked up a few other spots here and there that we, that we were catching fish on. And so we were just like, Oh man, like we have, we have like a half dozen spots now. Like we're good. We are, we're good. We're going to catch fish catching slams every trip and just flat out didn't happen. And then when you only have six spots and somebody's in one or two of them, right? If you don't get an early start and somebody beat you to it, that like wrecks the day. Right? Like, Oh my gosh, somebody, I just remember like being so frustrated. <laughs> and you're mad yeah. at the person too for being, yeah, in your Oh spot. yeah. That jerk, right. <laughs> that what like the nerve of him going to my spot, you know, and, and totally ruined the day, like wrecked the day. And, and now like, okay, great. Like it's, when it's about type of spot, now that you have an infinite amount of spots to go to, an infinite amount of potential spots to go to that are most likely going to be good as long as you have the right trends dialed in. And so now somebody's in one spot, okay, cool. Like I'll just go around the corner. There's a similar spot right around the corner that I've already identified um, because I had a, a, an effective pre-trip plan. There, somebody's in this one spot. Okay, no problem. Not let's go to the next one. Like, no, like now I, I have not had those times where I'm just like, oh my gosh, I hate this guy, the nerve of getting there faster. Now it's okay. Like whatever, there's, there's a ton of other similar spots that I can go to that are, that are more than likely going to be just as good, if not better. And you see, you seem calmer, you know, you haven't slung a, slung a weight to anyone in a while. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, for the record, I've never done that in particular, but, <laughs> but yeah, it just makes fishing, like nobody like fishing, you know, for at least most of us is just our favorite thing to do. It's like a, a, a favorite hobby. And, and it's, it's just not good when the hobby causes frustration, especially something that you can't control. Like somebody gets there sooner, like, oh, well, like, again, if, if you're doing it properly, you should have a, enough potential spots to go to where if, if there's somebody else in one or two of them, it's no big deal at all. Yeah, we'll pull, pull up that map. And then, Tony, uh, we've been hogging up the, uh, the mic here. To, uh, talk about, you know, your story real quick, why, why Luke looks up on the map and kind of your experience with doing the same thing that, Really, I mean, 99.9% .9 of us fall in the same trap. Yeah, so back when I started in shore fishing, that was 2015. So um, spring of 2015, that's when I got my first kayak and I decided to finally start inshore fishing. I mainly bass fished pretty much my whole life. And the problem I had was, like you said, I just had a handful of spots. I don't even think it was three spots now. I think it was like one or two that I just went to every weekend. Uh, just because I went online, which most people do, and they type in what's a good spot near me. And I found one, went there quite a few times, only caught very small trout uh, pretty much every trip. Couldn't figure out why. It looked like a good spot. But after 
you know, after I found you guys, that's when I really dug into like reading the maps and just reading uh, what the conditions are because with inshore waters, they're very shallow and the environment plays a big role on where those fish are going to be. The environmental factors, the wind, the tides, uh, water levels, water temperature, uh, the sun position, that can really determine where those fish are going to be because it's such a shallow environment compared to the ocean where you have, you know, 200 feet of water and a rock pile and those fish will sit on that one little rock pile for weeks, months, and possibly even the entire year. So spots for inshore are definitely not the same as spots for, you know, offshore, like GPS spots. So I quickly figured that out. And once I did, I started catching a lot more fish. Um, like I said, when you only got a handful of spots, you're really limiting yourself. You have to go out there and explore, like you said, Joe, uh, explore new areas, catch fish in new areas, because that's going to definitely increase your confidence when you go to new spots. And like uh, Luke was mentioning about just your mindset, if you go out there and you get frustrated, if you have a handful of spots and you go and see that there's somebody in that spot when you get there, don't get frustrated. You really have to be relaxed when you're on the water because if you go out there and you have a really bad mindset, you get in a bad mood, it's going to throw off the whole day. So just being able to pick out those types of areas, those types of spots and finding those types of spots instead of just having a handful of exact locations, it's definitely going to help you out when you're on, out there on the water. Yep. And, and real quick too, if you feel like we're picking on you, we're not, we've been in your shoes and, and two, it's, it's not your fault. And, and here's what I mean. Luke mentioned on the bass side of things and, and you know, that's one story. And then on the saltwater offshore side, you know, we, we actually started off as bass guys who grew up uh, in central Florida uh, lived on a lake and then we started doing offshore fishing pretty heavily for a while and and that really is kind of spot specific and so when we finally moved inshore our minds just because we that's all we had known is oh we just need a bunch of spots so we bought all those spot maps right and the truth about the spot maps is they're okay they, they give you a guide of what areas could be good but what's interesting and, and like you know Tony and I've talked about this offline some of the spots that he did find in the beginning were actually really good spots for like one specific scenario and they absolutely sucked the other half of the year and and a, a, a gps spot like if someone in a marina or a tackle store your buddy gives you a spot that that he fished or her or she fished yesterday and it was on fire i mean the very next day because weather has changed or a front comes in and the wind direction is different, that spot can be completely blown out and gone. And I think that's what we all tend to forget is, oh, yeah, these are just like evergreen spots. They're going to keep producing forever. And I caught one there yesterday, so the fish are going to be waiting on me today. And that's not the case, unfortunately. And, and once again, it's not your fault. And the even better news is it's, it's, uh, it's easier to solve than, than you think it is. And that's what we want to spend the rest of this uh, a webinar podcast video going over is is how to solve that and I think first Luke's got the map up and is you're going to show uh, that one area that we thought was our holy grail and turned out to be a uh, uh, you know a good spot during one specific time of the year yeah and so and so the number one thing to keep in mind is that the spots you fish need to be dependent on the the actual conditions of when you're fishing so the biggest mistake I see on like online forums and stuff is, Hey, like I'm going to you know, pick an area. Say, we'll say, we'll say, uh, we'll say Boca Grande in this case, going to Boca Grande, where should I fish? Right. And they don't say when they're going, they don't say what day they're fishing. And they definitely don't mention anything about like the wind speed or wind direction or the tides or anything. And people are saying, Oh, you have to go here or there. Uh, in this case, it's three sisters, but you know, this three sisters area is really good sometimes but in other situations, it's terrible. And we, for years, this was like one of our six spots. And we had some really good days there. We had some really, like, surprise, like, you know, get, catch a lot, cut a lot of slams there. But we, we had just as many, if not more days where we got totally skunked. We got nothing. We had not a bite at all and, or just caught catfish. And we really never thought about, you know, obviously, we, we, we thought about the tides. Like, that's what everybody thinks about, which is a factor but we never really thought about like the seasonality or the, and, and the wind and, and how really how they all interrelate. And, and so if you're not yet doing that, the number one takeaway from this is to start doing that. <laughs> just to 
just to start um, thinking more than just tides. Uh, it's really about the weather and, the, and, and even the, the trending weather. Is it getting hotter? Is it getting colder? And so, so this area in particular, for those who are, who are watching, uh, I'll, you can see it. And, and for those who haven't yet seen this, this is smartfishingtides.com. This is a site that we created to put all this stuff together for you. Um, as Tony mentioned before, you know, it's really about the, the tides, the weather. This has everything. We even, we even give hourly feeding projections on, you know, throughout the day, what, you know, what the, the, what statistically will be the best time of day to fish based on all of the known information. So we have hourly wind speed, direction, the, the, the temperature. Long story short, if you aren't yet using this, definitely give it a shot. It obviously has the tides as well. But, and on here as well, you can see radar, and then we're looking at the satellite map feature on smartfishingtides.com. So we're zoomed in here. This area is called Three Sisters. And it was right in this little cove. This was actually before this big old dock was built. And I remember coming here, uh, Dennis we came over here, we had some live bait. We anchored down like just off of this, off of the shoreline. This, what we have is we have a grass, like a, a grassy bay, a bay with grassy bottom that has a, sh a shelf that gets shallower and shallower and shallower and goes up to the shoreline. The shoreline has maybe, that's probably 30 yards of sand and then the grass starts and then it just starts getting just a little bit deeper and deeper and deeper. And there's a decent amount of current. If we'll zoom out, you can see it's not like in the main current flow, but it's close to it. Like here's the main current flow. It's close to main current flow. And I can't remember what season we were here, but we got here and we caught, we caught red, we caught multiple redfish, a bunch of trout and a couple snook. And I just remember that was our first time ever catching a slam. And we were trying for like years to catch, like for years of frustration on catching slams. We would all, we'd all, we've obviously caught all three, but like just getting them all together in one day and specifically one spot was like kind of the holy grail. And, uh, and it was finally happened. So like we were high five. Okay, great. We finally have a spot, but we'd come back here again and again, and again, and some days would be great, but in many days it would be, it'd be total bust. Um, and again, it's because the, the, either the season or the wind would, would change and make it totally different. So just for an example, right, it's wintertime now. So we'll give a winter example. So uh, as far as the seasonality, you know, in wintertime, especially after a cold front, like we just had, um, you know, fish are just looking for warmth. And, and so wind protected shorelines and, and actually in areas that don't have a ton of moving water is actually really good. Right. But in the summertime, that, that would be the total opposite. So on like a, on a, on a, a after cold front on a, you know, cold front day, winds ripping from the North, which is typically the case is that this little cove right here is statistically going to have the most fish because the water is going to be just a little bit warmer than everywhere else. Right. So what you're looking for is a little bit of as a water temperature, that's just a little bit warmer than everywhere else. So the, the fact that it's wind protected means that that cold air overnight just can't really impact the water as much as it would on an area with like a bunch of waves. So that's just more, it's more air to, it's more just surface area, right? That the air can actually penetrate into the water much more easy on the wavy side versus the calm side. So just that alone, just applying that one little factor, that tiny little factor, it seems small, but it is shocking how much of a difference it actually makes. So in the, in a cold, harsh, winter post winter uh, cold front winter time day of fishing this little cove would be would be really good but on a hot day right in the middle of summer uh and and the and the fish aren't looking for warmth right and and the, the science of, of in case you don't know the the actual science application of this and we and we go into more detail in in, in our, the courses we have on our site but the science is as water gets hotter and hotter the dissolved oxygen content gets lower and lower and, and dissolved oxygen is what fish use to breathe and for energy. And so as the water is getting super warm, the fish are getting more, are getting less comfortable, right? They can't, they can't breathe well, they have less energy. So they're not going to sit there and take it. They're going to go move to somewhere where there's more dissolved oxygen, where they feel more comfortable. So in the same exact spot, right? The same wind, wind speed, the same wind direction, this spot is going to be a bust because it's the wrong season. So long story short, this one you know, GPS spot can be great some days and can be terrible the other days. And if you don't know the reasons behind it, then you're gonna be like us for many, many years on just get, on having a lot of just skunk days when 
all you have to do is make one little change and it will totally change everything. In our mindset, once our mindset, once again, was probably like a lot of you is, I mean, that was such a productive spot and, and, it, and it produced for us off and on, but we never put it all together. And I still remember a day that was me, you and dad, and it, it was kind of a hike from where we were, you know, put our boat in and stuff anyways, even get there. And we finally get there and it's brutal hot. It's like a July or August day. And we're just sweating like crazy. We're in that little cove right there fishing those docks. And I mean, I'm talking like no CMs are out. There's no breeze back there. And it was brutal. And we got skunked. And after I like, I mean, we're so mad. Like, where, where did the fish go? And, and so let's, let's talk about that. Like, where, if, if this is not, or if this is a good spot now, or a bad spot in the, in the summer in those certain conditions, what, what's the answer? What are you doing differently today? Well, today I'm, I, I'm factoring in the variables, right? This obviously the season will de determine which variables I actually care about and which ones I don't. It'll, it'll kind of change the priority on which ones, which, and I factor in the, the, the wind heavily, the tides um, heavily as well, but like the wind is almost like just as important as the tides in my opinion now. And obviously the season, but just really the recent trend. So you know, it's, it's not, there's not like a perfect, you know, a scientific approach. A lot of it is art and a lot of it is just is having time on the water. Right? That's how the fishing guides can, can just statistically catch the most fish most consistently is because they're on the water every day or at least most days. And so a part of it is just being on the water and knowing the recent trends, but you know, those times, those trends are only as good as the weather is consistent. As soon as there's a weather change, those trends will totally, totally change. And if you don't know how that change of weather impacts the trend, you're going to, you're going to guess wrong or, or you're going to be flip, you know, flipping the coin if you're, if you're on point or not. Um, so what I'm doing now is really factoring in <clears throat> the recent trends and then the known weather coming up on the day that I'm fishing. And if there's a change in the weather, then I, I'm not going to follow the recent trends because I know there's going to be a change. I'll imp I'll change the, the plan uh, accordingly. But if there's no change at all, I just follow whatever has been working lately and just apply it to the next trip. So, um, and what I've found is that the, the times I've struggled the most, like the, the days where I've had the hardest time going out and catching fish is when I'm fishing my home waters and, and I get back into the spot mentality because it's just like our natural instinct to like, to go somewhere where you have confidence and it's easier to be confident in a spot that you've caught fish before than where you haven't. And I found that, uh, you know, part of, you know, part of my job is to go to new spots every week and I film it. I, I film the pre-trip plan just like this where I get on the map, look at the weather, look at the tides, talk about the recent trends and then apply it to the next trip. And then I go to an unknown area, I record it. I, you know, I obviously fish it, record it, and then share what worked and what didn't, like what part of the, the trends worked, what part of the plan worked and what part didn't work. And then how to, you know, how to learn a lesson from that for the next trip. So I do that every week in those trips, even though I'm fishing in areas I've never been to before, I, it, it is shocking. It's, it's been surprisingly how effective those days have been um, because I, I totally, I cannot go back to the number one mistake as far as I don't have any spots that I love. Like I don't have any spots that trump my, my thought process of, of looking at the type of spot because I don't know any spots, right? Like totally going in blind. And those days are surprisingly good. And then the times where I go back to my home waters and oh, I know the conditions are a little bit different than they should be, but I really like this spot and I go there and I just, I don't catch anything. And I, I wasted an hour or, or 20 minutes or however long it is. Um, it's, it's, it's impossible. Like it's that mindset is always there. And so it's, it's almost good to just go to totally new territory and apply this stuff because it's, it is surprising how effective it works as long as you don't get, uh, you don't let that, that GPS spot mentality, uh, mess, mess things up. Yep. And, and I don't know if this is for you, but we've actually been doing a 10 minute video every week. And this is for our insiders only where we get on a map just like this and break down, like literally show you based on the trends, based on the weather, where to go fishing every week. And that's kind of the little tag tag phrase of it is we show you exactly where to fish every single weekend in 10 minutes or less. And if you want to know more about that, it's at smartfishingspots.com. So smartfishingtides is where all that tide and weather and sonar and radar, all that is. 
in smart fishing spots is a special deal uh, that uh, now all of our insiders get it. It's part of the package uh, for our existing insiders. If you join here in the smart fishing spots, you'll get all of it together, Insider Club, the smart fishing spots, et cetera. So go check that out at smartfishingspots.com. It literally takes all the guesswork out of it. So if you don't have time to study maps for an hours upon hours before you go fishing and you want someone just to kind of tell you where to go fishing based on the trends, I mean, not the GPS spot, but say, hey, here's the kind of spots you want to look for and get on a map, then go check that out at smartfishingspots.com. Tony, yeah, what, Tony, or I'm sorry, keep going, Luke. I was going to say, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on our website now, the, the main site, saltstrong.com. So all, everything is on saltstrong. The smart fishing spots kind of summarizes it all. But, but on here, you can see the smart fishing game plan. So every week, uh, it's every Friday, here we go. It's like the cliff notes of, uh, of a fishing forecast, right? So every week, quick 10 minutes or less video talking about the recent trends and then showing the weather projections for the weekend and then just putting it all together and this is like the, the quickest and easiest way to, to know that you're going to be dialed into the right stuff and not wasting your time in the dead zones. So cool. here's just, here's where those posts are. So Tony, I, I want to flip it back to you. T talk about what changed. Obviously, you know, you, you joined the insider club. Um, from what I could tell, it was pretty game changing from a guy who was in, you know, a recovering bass fisherman to, uh, you know, to kind of going back to one spot, maybe two, and, and maybe catching a couple of trout. And now I, I don't know what the number is because it'd take a pretty big calculator to, to count how many redfish and speckled trout and snook and flatter and stuff that you've caught. But what, what, what changed and, and what are you doing differently now? I think the biggest change that I made was just, you know, getting outside of my comfort zone, going to new spots. And especially after I join you guys, I'm, I'm doing the same thing Luke's doing. I'm going out and going to new spots and filming it, showing what I was doing, what was working and when. And just by going to new spots, catching fish in new spots, finding fish in new spots, it definitely boosts your confidence level. So when you do go to pick another new spot, uh, you know what you're looking for, you know when you should be going there, you know what you should be using, and it's going to definitely increase your results. I mean, now I've got I don't know, probably over a hundred spots in just one little area. And I can filter through those spots throughout the year and go to the ones that produce based on the conditions. So keeping a log of what you're doing, uh, w when you're catching fish, where you're catching fish, what the conditions were, that's definitely going to help out. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'd have to say the biggest change I made was just getting outside of my comfort zone and exploring, going to different spots and just understanding uh, the behavior of fish under different conditions. So let, let's say you're, you're, you fish a lot of Titusville. Let's say you're going completely somewhere new. Uh, let's just say Jacksonville, you know, um, a couple hours north or so. W what do you do in the pre-trip planning? What do you, what are you looking at? Is it, is it wind? Obviously, you know, talk about what you're looking for on satellite maps. What's going through your head? Yeah. Like for example, the past two weeks that I've went out, uh, I've been finding fish on a western shoreline. Right, right now we're in the winter time, so I've been fishing uh, fishing shorelines that are on the west side um, of the of the river or of the bay. Uh, they typically get hit by the sun first in the winter time, so those areas are going to be a little bit warmer. Also, they're usually going to have that wind protection. So I'd be looking for areas similar similar to that that I have been fishing when I'm looking for new spots. So that's where it comes down to just applying what's working for you where you're at to a newer spot. That way you can get on those fish. Cool. And in, in terms of wind, Luke had mentioned that that's like a really important factor for him. What do you think? Say that again. Uh, wind. When, as far as? I uh, know, uh, wind, like uh, the oh, wind, wind is blowing through <laughs> your hair right now. Gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, the wind direction is definitely going to play a huge factor, uh, depending not even the direction, but just the wind speed, especially in the uh, winter versus summer, or how I like to break it down the warmer periods versus the colder periods. Uh, the colder periods, I'm looking for the wind protection. In the warmer periods, I'm looking for areas that are getting a little bit stirred up because it's going to help aerate that water in the summertime and in the warmer months. So it'll help cool it down, just like Luke was saying with the uh, dissolved oxygen. 
in the summertime, you want to look for those areas that are, you know, the water's moving, it's getting churned, uh, churned up, it's cooling down, it's getting uh, aerated and oxygenated, and just the opposite in the wintertime. Uh, the water is cool enough that it doesn't need that wind to aerate it to help oxygenate it. What you want is a nice, calm, flat area where that sunlight can penetrate through the water and help warm up that area because that's going to be comfortable for the bait and it's also uh, going to be comfortable for the fish. So definitely looking for wind protection in the wintertime and a little bit of wind in the summertime. And it's better for the angler in the wintertime having the, yeah. the calmer. In the summer. Definitely yeah. easier to fish out of the wind. <laughs> yes. And do you remember all those days we sat in those coves in the summertime, just totally baking in the sun and there's no wind because we caught a lot of fish there like a couple winters ago. And, uh, and we just gave be getting just crushed by the, by the sun hot as can be. And that's not the, not generally they're going to be the best spot to go to, especially if there's, if there's no current, the water's going to be hot. The fish are going to be out of there. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I ended up getting melanoma and uh, I blame a lot on, on those spots. And I, <laughs> I tried to contact Morgan and Morgan to see if we could sue the spot, but apparently that was outside of all, all, all realm of, of, of law. So <laughs> and I'm kidding. I'm not trying to sue a spot. Um, so what, what else, Luke, what, any, any other, uh, big idea? Oh, I see someone's pulling up Sebastian Inlet. Oh boy. Yeah. So I just wanted to touch on this a little bit. If you live in Florida or if you've been to Florida, I'm sure you've heard of Sebastian Inlet. It's a really good spot. However, it's not always a good spot, even from season to season, even just time of day and the tide. That's one of the biggest things that I've found to be um, quite a determining factor, especially around inlets and passes. They hold fish pretty much year round. And the biggest factor is going to be something as small as the time of day or the, the tide, like I said before. So I've fished here quite a few times when I first started fishing over here pretty much just winged it, just went out there, didn't care about the tide, didn't care about the time of day, just went out there, started fishing, and got skunked a handful of times. And then I go home, I'd look online, and I see pictures of people posting, you know, massive snook, massive redfish, and it's like, okay, those fish are there, but they obviously weren't eating when I was there. So just networking with people, trying to figure out when the best bite is, and just that experience out there on the water is definitely going to help as well, just so you know when the best times are. And another thing are the tides. Sometimes in these inlets and passes, what the tide station says can be completely off just because of you know, how far uh, the inlet is or, or how, let's say, how big the inlet is. If it's very narrow, if it's very wide, you're going to have water flowing at different times, so it's not going to be exact to that actual tide station. So there could be a delay. And again, just by networking with people, you can get a better understanding of when that tide's going to change as opposed to looking at the uh, actual tide chart. Mm -hmm. So the tide charts are handy, but you do have to just be in a network with people to get a, a better understanding of when the best type of uh, time or tide or time of day is to fish a spot. And uh, another thing with the insider group is the community. We have a community of we have what over 11,000 uh, members now, and you can basically ask people, you know, when, when is the best bite? I'm going to this area. When's the best time to go out here? If you don't have that time to get out there on the water, which definitely helps. So it could be a very popular spot, but if you don't know when the best times to go there, you're going to have yourself a tough time on the water. Yeah. Yeah. I saw 70 people, 70 joined just yesterday alone. If you guys saw that email from Carol, it's awesome. Nice. Um, Luke, anything else on your end? Yeah. And, and Tony hit on it perfectly. And, uh, you know, part of it is what we're talking about as far as just knowing the, the, the mechanics, like the proper mechanic, kind of like football, like know how to tackle. Right. But like, just know again, how the fish move, you know, statistically where they're going to be or where they're not going to be based on the tides, the season, the weather, but there, there's no replacement of actually being on the water. Again, that's why, like, that's why fishing guides are catching the most fish most consistently. But they're not, they're not that great just for going out there all the time. If you, if you know any fishing guides, almost all of them will have a small network of other guys that they call when, when in need of help or if they're having a tough day, like they're, they're, help, they're helping each other out. Nothing is better than real-time human-to-human correspondence because no matter how good you are, 
at knowing like the proper mechanics on finding good spots and using online maps and knowing how fish move, you know, sometimes like red tides come in, like that's been happening uh, you know, more and more frequently, it seems like on the, along the Gulf coast. And so no matter how good you are at all that map reading stuff, if you don't know about some, some of the, the real time knowledge of exactly what's happening in, in a given area, yeah, I mean, you could, you could be, you could have an awful day, but knowing that like the, the human, uh, I think the, the human intelligence is, is for me was the biggest impact to my fishing game. Uh, like I was getting pretty good. And the biggest growth I ever had was uh, a buddy of mine, Nick just started, uh, we decided to start fishing some tournaments and there's a tournament series over in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne, Melbourne, Florida in the Indian river. And like, we were pretty good. Like we were going out and like, we would have them days where we would catch like some legit trout, like 26 plus inch trout, you know, every once in a while, like it was happening every once in a while. So, okay, let's, let's do a tournament. Like sometimes some of these might, might win us some money. And what happened is we, you know, there's usually like 40 boats, usually about five or six guides would be in those. So we're competing against guides at this point. And so like, that was our, so our goal was at least to, hey, let's, let's see if we can beat some of these guides. And, and, and what happened is that we started befriending some of the other, the other teams, just like us, we had corporate jobs, right? We couldn't fish at all during the week. And then most weekends we couldn't fish. So, but at least one of us, there was four groups, like four teams that we all kind of like just became friends and started sharing our information. Right. So sometimes we would be able to pre-fish the tournament and the others wouldn't and vice versa. And so we would go out there and we would just share what we saw. Like, Hey, um, the fish were on the wind protected shorelines, like check those out. The redfish, the big redfish are there. The trout are on the, on the deeper grass flats. And so then all of us would fish those same type of spots. And over time, as we got more and more comfortable with each other, we would start sharing more and more information. And by the end of it, at least one of us was on the leaderboard every single tournament. In many cases, multiple, like, you know, we were actually on the all in leaderboard in some cases, but it was the sharing of information and, and real time information that was much more important. Cause before that I was, I actually, I literally would print out a tight sheet of every trip I fished and I like an actual graph and I would mark on that graph where I was and then exactly when in that tide cycle I caught which fish. And thinking that that was the answer, it was uh, thinking that, okay, I just, it's all statistics. Like I need to, I need to master the statistics part. In reality, it was the real time human intelligence was way more valuable to the point now where I don't do any more detailed tracking of my trips because, you know, January last year compared to January this year can be totally different. And the, the statistical data can be way off. But if you have human intelligence, especially like real time human intelligence, nothing trumps that because that's some, that's exactly what happened yesterday. And, uh, and then just knowing the human intelligence plus how a change in weather will impact what just recently happened. Like that's, that was the key for me to, to go from, you know, from having some like pretty good days or having some really good days, but then having just as many, um, bad, get bad days. To, to like really going out and, and being totally confident that I'll be able to go out and catch some quality fish every trip, regardless if I'm going somewhere I've never been to before or if I'm going in my, in my, in my home waters. So human intelligence is, is shockingly valuable. Just so happens we have an 11,000 person network of human yeah, that's, intelligence. Yeah, and that's why we did And that's why it's growing, right? That's, that's why we did it. And, and that's why, you know, more and more members are going And the fact that and it's not, the great thing is that it's not just about like, yeah, hey, you have to, yeah, you have to know somebody in Sebastian Inlet, Florida, or in a certain spot, like in, in many cases, the trends are kind of at the macro level, um, like on the big fronts moving, you know, coming and going, uh, obviously some of the localized stuff does happen, but yeah, we now have, uh, members from Texas, like all the way along the Gulf. Uh, Florida is the biggest, obviously that's where it started, but we've had members all the way up the Atlantic, you know, up past, uh, past New Jersey. Yep. Cool. Well guys, what we found after now coaching tens of thousands, personally coaching tens of thousands of, of, a, of inshore saltwater anglers. And, you know, we have anywhere from 200,000 to 300,000 unique anglers a month on saltshore.com, millions of views on YouTube every month. And, and what we found is that there's only two types of anglers, just two. And, and the first person, I'm hoping that's not you. Actually, I know it's not you if you listen this far. They're the ones who just want to do it on, the, on, the, on their own. They, 
they get some joy about just pain and suffering of just doing it trial and error. I mean, looking back, like, and we created this Insider Club because it's what we wish was around when we were frustrated. And like, it would have shaved off, I'm guessing five plus years. I mean, how we just spent one year in the Insider Club, it probably would have taken five, if not 10 years off of the learning curve. And and, and the, the first type of angler does not like that. They don't believe in shortcuts. They get weird about, te about technology. Like we get some messages. Like when we talk about technology and using online maps, there's some old salty dudes out there that hate that. Like they don't want anything to do with it. And, and we don't want to work with people like that. And I'm guessing that's not you. I'm guessing you're probably a lot like me and, and like Luke and Tony. And the second type of angler is, is, is us, the people who, who do like shortcuts. Who, who would love to learn from people's mistakes, right? That invest in themselves and value their time. And if that's you and you want someone to help do it for you and literally shave off years of the learning curve, then join us in the Insider Club. You can even get a whole year completely for free if you go to smartfishingspots.com and pick up that system today. So that's www.smartfishingspots.com. Tom, I hope to see you there. Luke, Tony, thank you so much. I have to bolt. And uh, guys, uh, check you out over at smartfishingspots.com. If you're a current insider, boom, you already get and it's hooked up. It's in your account right now. We out. Alrighty. Good Ten times. Lines in less time. Yeah, baby. <laughs>